So good morning everybody. How do we holistically consider all of the elements that make Manchester a great place and how are we going to make sure that we focus on those for the future development of our great city? There's no one-size-fits-all approach, so you go to different town centres and each town centre has its own history, its own uh, merits, the things it's doing well, um, and we need to uh, get under the skin of that to understand what the right solution is for different town centres. What worked well? What was the high street? Uh, what did the high street consist of? What hasn't worked so well? And essentially engaging communities to understand what they want from the town centres. The music to my ears is actually that everybody now is talking about community first rather than in the past, I think everybody just was you know, given a next or given what whatever the other town centre had, we've spent some time sort of unpicking a town centre, understanding who the community is. That data capture is really important to understand the consumer behaviours and why somebody might want to go to that town centre. I am seeing a lot of identical thinking in this and the worry is that town centres are becoming middle class playgrounds. The debate, I think, should be moving on, not from whether it's a retail led, but how we make it more inclusive. A food market is not the silver bullet, but it has, Altrincham was on its knees when the market was reinvented. I think there's a place for it, without doubt, but um, equally landlords need to be flexible and more entrepreneurial in their approach to attracting these businesses, taking a long-term view and a partnership in activating the ground floor and what that does for the wider regeneration. The quantum of spend within Greater Manchester over the coming 20 years is absolutely huge. And if we, if we don't really think now about how we're going to do that, how we're going to collaborate, how we're going to work together, how we're going to think differently, and how we're going to put people at the heart of it, not place, Place is really, really important, it's vital, but we've got to put people in the place. It's about really understanding what people want. Who, who owns the land? Is it, is it the local authority, private developers? And, and how do we release that land for development? How do we remediate it? How do we take the risk away from the developer, which is reducing the amount of affordable housing they can accommodate, and get the people in the right place to staff the community facilities we need to build that 15-minute town? And if we want multi-generational living within our town centres, we need to provide those amenities, and they need to be there first. If, if say for example, there was a local authority involved, the, the, the local authority were able to um, you know, add value by bringing other sites involved, or um, I think maybe down to planning, if there was a, 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 a kind of a, a better route for developers that want to be engaged with uh, affordable housing providers, you know, we find sometimes, um, like the Section 106 is, is bogged down with yeah. you know, strange rules that um, just kind of yeah. stall things. Who's going to hold the stewardship role for some of our town centres once they are regenerating? And that we check in every now and again, is it performing and what can we do rather than wait for them to deteriorate, which has, has happened in the past. We've talked previously through governments about levelling up the north-south divide. I often wonder whether or not we should be looking at our own internal divide across the Greater Manchester district. Some areas clearly need more investment than they get, mm -hmm. and yet they're not seen as a priority. There needs to be more done to equalise that balance, to give the investors the attraction. Tra transport is absolutely the catalyst though, isn't it? And can they actually afford to live in a place to travel to their place of work? Those problems have to be solved first to open up economic growth in areas, particularly in the north of our region, so that we've got better arterial routes to open up the investment. I think the demand is there. I think at the moment, with the government telling us to not work, what to work from home if we can, that isn't helping and when that changes, you would hope that slowly but surely the, the travel patterns would return. We've got a public transport system that is dependent on its fare box in order to uh, cover its costs and we've been hiding that for the time being because there have been temporary pandemic management funds in place. Uh, but if we look at the bus system for example, it's carrying around two thirds of regular demand at the moment. Even in the very tightest parts of lockdown, it was carrying around 40% of demand. Why? Because they were the people who we still expected to go places, to run our hospitals, to run our public services, to front up um, essential retail. Um, but if we can't find a way of putting the 60% demand back in to the system, then we've got a real problem in terms of supporting that 40% that um, uh, longer term. So we've got to kind of encourage people back to work. We've got to give them the working environment that makes them want to come in to collaborate in a space, in an office. We've got to make the office environment less sterile but still safe. 
got to kind of break down those, those, those barriers. Home is work and work is social um, and you know it's all it's all mixed up isn't it which is fantastic which for, for us at Bruntwood Works, what we've been concentrating on is to have a hospitality offer on the ground floor as opposed to it being a, a sterile reception area. So I guess it's the, the blending of spaces now. The key to it is engaging people now. I, I'm, I'm talking tenants of all tenures. We don't want, we want to, again, we, we need to be learning from the past where we've gone and done things to people's homes or we've built homes that we thought that people wanted. We've got to develop the narrative and the language now so that when the change occurs and the, the, the changes won't, won't be that long away, people expect it, people are, you know, involved in it, they're engaged in it, they understand it. You know, I'm seeing significant change at the moment around the collection of data. Now the money is betting on sustainability and I think that's for us the biggest sea change in everything. I think we've got to be careful on, on retrofit. You have to look at it objectively with a very, very clear conscience and a clear mind and sometimes it doesn't work. It's not the answer for everything. Yeah, we, we've developed a, a carbon calculator that we use when we're developing you know, new developments but also retrofitting as well and it, will, it gives the client an indication of if you switch out this materiality, this material, it reduces your embodied carbon. But you've got to tie that into the operational side of the building as well and what the operational carbon emissions are. And we are probably only one government away from the, the business rates being completely torn up and we will be taxed on your carbon emissions per square foot. Within the next five years, as values mature, as the, the cost of technology reduces, we can get there. And I think within the next five years, net zero carbon as standard in our family housing is possible. We now need quite an intensive period of transition between now and the middle part of the decade to make sure that we don't now pursue a carbon agenda that is actually socially exclusive um, in nature. We need to work out how we put ourselves back on that right path.